Grossen, Saltcoats and Stevenson run into each other and are known as the three tunes with Saltcoats in the middle. Saltcoats has an older but much smaller harbour than that at Ardrossen, and as its name implies, was once engaged in the salt industry, using local coal to evaporate seawater for the extraction of the salt residue. It is written that a castle once stood on the north side of the harbour, while fossil trees were discovered amongst the rocks where the harbour dries out at low tide. In this old film, we see the braes being filled in, where ships were being built at the end of the 19th century. This was to form a strong barrier to the unpredictable sea and to reclaim land for permanent use. Ardrossen and Saltcoat are built on reefs sticking out into the Firth of Clyde. Even when faced with stout concrete walls, the sea does not always recognise this boundary and comes surging over at high tide in winter gales when even the trains can be disrupted. Dockhead Street is Saltcoat's main shopping area, but on this occasion shopkeepers found themselves a little too near the coast. Handy for the summer visitors crowding the shoreline, certainly, but winter custom could have been served better by being further inland and ten feet or so higher up. Dockhead Street is now pedestrianised, but this was an early taste of it, and only the most intrepid motorist would risk a vehicle through the flood. Key Street runs off at right angles to the angry sea and bears a plaque to a hardy lady who lived there. Betsy Miller, in the 18th century, became the first female captain of any ship recorded in Lloyd's British Register of Tonnage. Living in Saltwoods, maybe she was used to having wet feet. The soldier on his high plinth in the Saltcoats War Memorial should be well above high tide level, yet his unveiling was not without incident, as this vintage piece of film records. Local organisations rallied to the call and joined the parade heading for the meeting point of four roads, Hamilton Street, Man Street, Caledonia Road and Ardrossan Road, where a new memorial was to be a central focus. After the ladies came the boys' brigade with their pipes and drums. Followed by the Boy Scouts in their less formal uniform and civic dignitaries, councillors, lady masons, children and townspeople. Lastly, the Masons, who will take up the front ranks at the ceremony. The Union Jack hangs draped over the memorial on this breezy day, and a hush falls for an oration and the pipers of the Royal Scots Fusiliers slow march to the flowers of the forest. The 
buglers of the same regiment blow a poignant last toast, and the Marchioness of Ailsa steps up to do the unveiling. She pulls on the cord, with no result. She pulls again, and again harder. A member of the platform party steps forward to assist, but their combined efforts cannot shift the drape. Eventually a ladder is brought, the flag is removed, and Saltcoat seized for its new war memorial, soon to be garlanded and festooned in floral wreaths. Saltcoats has gained a new landmark, joining the skyline dominated by the tower of St Cuthbert's Church. Most communities have a war memorial, and Kilmarnock has a splendid one, designed in 1927 by James Miller. Across the road stands the Dick Institute, which houses the town's library, museum and art gallery, while nearby, in this civic setting, there is a statue of Sir James Shaw, who was born on the outskirts of Kilmarnock and became Lord Mayor of London in 1805. The end of the Great War was a time for rejoicing, but also a time tinged with great sadness for the loss of many citizens whose names would soon appear on the town's war memorial. This film shows the feast day celebrations in Kilmarnock at the end of that war, when returning and home-based troops and other uniformed organisations and citizens joined in parading from one end of Kilmarnock to the other. After the parade, a tree is planted in remembrance. Could this gentleman have been a fireman on a locomotive once? The parade returns marching over cobbled streets at a junction on the tram route which ran from Rickerton in the south to Beansburn at the north end of the town, with a branch eastwards from the town centre to Harrowford. 
Increasing competition from motor buses led to a steady decline in revenue, and the end of the trams came in 1926, coinciding with the start of the general strike. The personal sacrifices of the war to end all wars had achieved nothing, and many of those returning home faced unemployment or cuts in wages and a grim struggle for survival. Kiln Cross has seen even the buses banished now and the town centre pedestrianised. King Street is now decorated with street furniture and sculptures where once it was difficult to walk across the road because of the volume of traffic. Kilmarnock has a strong link with Robert Burns as it was here in 1786 that John Wilson printed the Kilmarnock edition of Burns' poems which set him on his way to fame. The Dune Valley has had more than its share of slumps and unemployment, but it still comes up smiling with a strong community spirit. Here we see an exodus from the local store for the Dalmellington Fancy Dress Parade. The shop assistants might as well come too, as there will be no customers for the next hour or so. The valley has a long tradition of music making through brass or silver bands. Here, one of the local bands is playing outside the former Craigmark School, about a mile out from Dalmellington. As mining in the area diminished, the population gravitated to the floor of the valley, concentrating around Dalmellington and Patna. The band marches off from Craigmark, followed by its supporters and arrives in the centre of Dalmellington, where the square is thronged with crowds coming in from the converging streets to see the parade. Later comes a football match, another keen pastime in the area, and a final flourish of music to send the spectators happily home. As an example of an inland local industry, let us take a look at the Ortho Free Tile Works. There is little trace of it to be seen today, but its smoking kilns were once highly visible from the air to Cumnock Road. It served the farming community well in its time, providing drainage tiles to bring many an Ayrshire field into a more productive state. Deposits of clay lie at the foot of the hill of Ortho Free. These have been exploited since the end of the 19th century when the L-Plan range of buildings went into operation. As the banks of clay are prepared, slices or flakes are detached. These are collected in barrows and wheeled away over a temporary base of wooden board. At a wagonway, they are transferred to flange wheel bogies, which are hauled up the incline by a fixed rope. Lime is mixed into the clay to make it more plastic, 
Then the clay is forced through a template to mould and cut it to the required shape. The shape lengths are stacked in racks for drying. When dry, they are hardened by being fired in a kiln where the door is sealed to keep the heat in. After several days when firing has been completed, the kiln is allowed to cool, the brick wall is broken down and the tiles are removed when cold. They are stacked neatly to await orders, then driven off to their final destination in fields, by the side of the road or maybe in someone's garden. Irvine has another fine sandy beach and a harbour which was once the seaport for Glasgow some 30 miles away. Irvine's harbour sits at the juncture of the rivers Irvine and Garnock, which are the two most northerly of Ayrshire's six rivers. The new town was grafted onto the old one in 1966, so Irvine has grown rapidly since then and has seen many changes. The overcrowded Royal Academy was closed and replaced by a secondary school at Ravens Park. Poet Robert Burns came to Irvine in 1781 to learn the trade of flax dressing. The Irvine Burns Club has a fine museum in honour of the poet and the town, which includes murals showing scenes from the poet's life. It also has a unique collection of holograph letters from famous people such as Dickens, Conan Doyle, Disraeli and Teddy Roosevelt. Just after Burns's visit, the parish church was rebuilt in its present form and with Hill Street still evokes the spirit of former days. Ninety years later, Frederick Pilkington's Trinity Church was to soar higher, but its time as a church was much shorter and today it's an art centre. Many people considered the view of Irvine Bridge and the churches to be the finest in town. Banners had other visions and obliterated that bridge and view with a river spanning chopping mile. Irvine's nostalgia for the past is most apparent at the annual Merry Mass celebration, one of Scotland's oldest fairs. Every year, five girls are chosen from local schools to be Queen and her four Marys celebrating a visit to the town by Mary, Queen of Scots, in 1563. The Queen is crowned outside the townhouse in the High Street, which has been closed to traffic from early in the day. It is not surprising that Irvine has a high regard for its fair and took the third Earl of Eglinton to court and won when he tried to stop it in 1557. The town derived great financial benefit from the influx of merchants and visitors while the townspeople enjoyed a holiday for the 10 days duration of the fair. 
The races on Irvine Moor are a popular part of the celebration. All can take part, from tiny tots to the great heavy horses of the local carters, which fairly shake the ground as they charge to the finishing post. Beyond the abandoned hospital at Ravens Park lies Bogside, which was the site of another Ayrshire racecourse. With the race is over, the traffic heads eastward to the railway crossing to rejoin the public road, while pedestrians make for the rail halt, which was to close with the end of racing in 1967. Irvine has a good mix of industries, including knitwear, papermaking, pharmaceuticals, glassmaking, metalworking, forklift trucks, and the making of golf clubs. The elegant stable block at Eglinton became a food processing plant outlasting Eglinton Castle whose ruins are now the centre of a popular country park. Prestwick is a coastal town without a harbour but it is the only place in Ayrshire with an aerodrome. It played a vital role as an Atlantic ferry terminal during World War II and later became an international civil airport. Under the control of the British Airport Authority, it showed decline, but since being bought out as an independent concern, it's flourishing and expanding once more under the name Glasgow Prestwick. Farming has stamped the dominant design on the Ayrshire landscape with field systems, hedgerows, shelter belts and sturdy farm buildings leading backwards and ever upwards to the high moors and inland boundaries of the county. But the westward facing coastline is another principal feature of the area. It represents a highway for trade and fishing and a vital zone for tourism. It is not surprising that so many people choose to live by the sea to enjoy these glorious western seascapes at the end of the day. <laughs> 